Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's 34th Virtual YMCA Education Series Program with the North Suburban YMCA. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I'm a personal trainer and the adult program coordinator at the NSYMCA in Northbrook, Illinois. We are recording this evening's presentation so that you'll be able to revisit it again and again. Please feel free to tell your family and friends about it so that they too can view it on either the IBJI or NSYMCA websites. I am pleased to introduce to you tonight, Dr. Brian Clay, who is a physiatrist and interventional pain management specialist with Illinois Bone and Joint Institute. Dr. Clay has been with IBJI since the summer of 2015, and as a physiatrist, he is a nerve, muscle, and bone expert who treats injuries and illnesses that impact how the human body moves. In his presentation this evening, entitled, I Don't Want Pills, I Don't Want Surgery, and I Don't Want Pain, Dr. Clay will address joint, spine, and nerve pain and talk about how to find the right help to take control of your pain. Brian Clay, MD, is, a board is board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, as well as in pain medicine. In addition, he has fellowship training in anesthesia pain. With all, what all of that means is that Dr. Clay has expertise in pain management, interventional pain management, and individual independent medical evaluations. Easy for me to say. Another key area of his expertise is outpatient sports medicine. Many of Dr. Clay's patients rely on him to manage painful arthritic conditions affecting their physical peripheral joints and to manage pain due to disorders of the cervical and lumbar spine. As you can imagine, given his area of expertise, he also works with individuals who have suffered traumatic brain injuries and or spinal cord injuries. Born and raised in Chicago, Dr. Clay has been fascinated by science since childhood. He earned an undergraduate degree in biochemistry and after completing medical school at the University of Illinois, Chicago, he concentrated his focus on physical medicine and rehabilitation. During his internship and residency at Northwestern University's McGaw Medical Center and the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, Dr. Clay was named chief resident. He has a passion for helping others. And as a result, Dr. Clay is constantly exploring innovative practices and techniques, such as genicular nerve ablation, a non-surgical procedure, for relieving knee pain and the use of stem cell and regenerative medicine treatments for musculoskeletal conditions. Dr. Clay says that many times his patients land in his clinic after having been told that they have a condition that is either incurable or non-operative and that they should just sort of bear the pain. However, oftentimes he finds that just by taking a step back, reevaluating the clinical data, and most importantly, listening to the patient he can often determine the underlying root cause of the condition, and then by treating that through a tailored program, he and his team are usually able to solve the problem and get the patient back to functioning. And let's face it, at the root of it, I think that is everyone's goal, to function and to do our everyday and aspirational activities as pain-free as possible. During Dr. Clay's presentation this evening, you might find that you have questions, which he will be happy to address at the end of the program. Simply type your questions into the question section on your screen and I will receive them and relay them to Dr. Clay immediately following his presentation. We will do our best to answer all the questions that you share, so feel free to ask multiple questions as they arise tonight. I do ask that you please keep your questions general as Dr. Clay will not be able to address individual concerns without individual consultation. If you do have self-specific questions, please contact Dr. Clay via one of the options that will be listed on the slide that we'll be showing during the Q&A portion at the end of his presentation. One last thing before I turn the podium over to Dr. Clay, I invite you to mark your calendar for our next IBJI and NSYMCA Education Series program on Wednesday, November 30th at 7 p.m. Dr. Ryan Harold will host Understanding Shoulder Pain. Thank you again for joining us tonight and thank you Dr. Brian Clay for your time and effort in putting together this program to help us learn about managing pain without pills and without surgery. Now, Dr. Clay, please take it from here. Okay. Let's see. Are you seeing the screen okay, Karen? I sure am. Okay, great. Well, Karen, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. I want to thank everyone who, who has uh, taken time out of their evening uh, 
uh, to listen to this talk. I think it will be informative. I'm going to cover some um, common conditions here that I, that I think might hit home for some of you in the audience. And then uh, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up with a little Q&A uh, session, as, as Kieran alluded to. So, um, so yeah, the title, I don't want pills, I don't want surgery, and I, and I don't want pain. So actually got this as a quote from one of my nearest, dearest patients uh, who came in one day frustrated with her care. And, and you know, it, it kind of resonated with me. And, and, it, and it's something that I think about when, when I approach most of my, most of my cases uh, day to day. Um, so for the, the purpose of, of this talk, we are going to um, examine some current treatment options uh, for common degenerative conditions of, of the joints, conditions of the spine, uh, and, and nerve pathology. So basically, there's a regimented protocol for most things we do in medicine, but nothing's a, a cookie cutter uh, approach. And oftentimes these cases don't fit in a neat uh, box. So uh, when these first or second line therapies fail, we'll discuss some of those alternative uh, therapies to offer patients in the pain clinic. We'll also highlight uh, in the end some new treatments in the field of regenerative medicine, which I look, to, uh, look at as being the new frontier in medicine as, as we progress throughout the next uh, few decades here. Um, so our population is aging, right? Uh, and, you know, this is a good thing. This means that we're doing a good job in medicine. We're, we're doing what we're supposed to do. We're prolonging life. We're getting everyone to their golden years, right? Well, you know, with this aging uh, population also comes uh, aging, uh, uh, problems with aging. And um, one of the more common problems that we see in, in our clinics in Illinois Bone and Joint uh, are problems with degenerative conditions. There's a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. The longer time you spend on this planet, uh, the longer you're under the force of gravity and the more force the joints undergo. And over time, the cells start to degenerate and break down within joints and other uh, systems within the body. Um, so this type of these types of conditions, these degenerative conditions, really affect the quality of life of our patients. Just the ability to be able to perform basic tasks around the house, to be to be productive in society, to be able to go to the grocery store when you need to, playing with your kids or grandkids, gardening, you name it. Um, all of these activities are impacted by many of these degenerative conditions that I'll that I'll talk about. Uh, moving forward here tonight. And I think it's important that we always keep in mind uh, that when patients come in to see us, whether it's in the pain clinic, whether it's for uh, consultation for surgery, uh, their primary um, objective for, for treating with the physician is, is to improve their life, uh, to manage their condition, ideally to, uh, to solve their problem, right? And so I think it, it, it's important as a medical community, as physicians, as pain doctors, as orthopedic surgeons, rheumatologists, uh, neurologists, I think that we all have to keep the patient's focus in mind when we approach their case. So we're gonna start out with our first patient. Uh, this, so this is Mary, Mary's 75, and she comes in with chronic low back pain. Now, this pain seemed to gradually worsen over the past year or so. I mean, she's had pain off and on over the years. She actually used to work um, as a uh, administrative assistant for a number of years. A lot of sitting and it was entailed in that, in that position. Uh, but this pain is to the point where she can't stand it any, any longer. So she comes in, she's describing the pain as mostly localized to the lower back, around the waist, belly button area. The pain doesn't travel, it doesn't go into the legs, it's right in the back, it's worse when she tries to straighten up the spine and, and walk reasonable distances. And when she sits and rests, the, the pain tends to subside a bit. Now, sometimes in bed, rolling over the wrong way, she'll feel it, but for the most part, it is mostly activity-based. Um, now, she's been taking some leaves, some Tylenol occasionally, um, and she's trying to kind of walk her way through this, but it's not working. Um, now, she does have a history of osteoarthritis or, or, or some degeneration in the hip, and she's had some hip surgeries in the past, and they, and they went well. Uh, and she had been doing well in, until this, this recent decline over the past year. So, 
This is a case of osteoarthritis. In this case, uh, we're talking about osteoarthritis of the facet joints or the joints in the spine. Um, so basically, osteoarthritis refers to chronic uh, wear and tear of joints. Uh, so the joints in the body are interfaces between bones, okay? So a bone is joined to another bone via a joint uh, or connected via ligaments and the joint. And within the joint, there's cartilage. Okay, and, and this cartilage has a structure which is amenable to wearing down over time. Uh, and basically, when the cartilage wears down, the bone that, not, that lies beneath the cartilage begins to change. So it'll thicken, it'll grow, it'll grow out bone spurs. So you'll, you'll get some changes within the cortex of the bone or the inner part of the bone. And this enlargement of the bone and the degenera degeneration of the cartilage creates a narrowing of the space in between the bones. Okay, and that space is called the joint space. And this is the hallmark of uh, wear and tear osteoarthritis. So our initial treatment plans for osteoarthritis or most degenerative conditions are pretty much regimented like I alluded to earlier. So uh, usually we'll start out the patient with some over-the-counter pain medication, Tylenol, leave, uh, send them over for physical therapy to address uh, some dysfunction within the joint or region of the body. Um, so sometimes we'll add in a complementary alternative medicine in, in our treatment program, or, or the patients will seek out these treatments on their own, whether that be uh, you know, nutritional interventions, whether that be acupuncture, chiropractic, and, and so, so on. Um, in some cases, you know, patients are started on prescription painkillers, whether that be prescription anti-inflammatories, uh, medications for nerve pain, uh, like gabapentin, or, or even opioid pain medications like uh, tramadol or, or norco or hydrocodone. Um, most of the time, uh, there's a lot of education that occurs in the therapeutic process. So physical therapy is a great start for patients. And this is where they get to learn about their condition. They get to learn about ways to modify their activities to decrease their pain. Um, and in addition to this, um, we also utilize minimally invasive procedures in the, at, at the bedside in the office at times to boost our, our, our treatment, okay? Now, um, these injections um, of steroid can be performed in various locations, usually performed within the joint. And the goal of these uh, injections, when we're talking about uh, injections performed in, in joints, is to reduce pain and inflammation that occurs uh, from the underlying process in the joint. Uh, also to improve mobility uh, of the joint, better range of motion. Uh, and if the patient's in therapy, typically the injection will sort of enhance the outcomes uh, as, as the patient progresses in therapy, giving them the best chance to get the optimal outcome from the therapeutic process. Uh, there's also, with regards to knee um, or osteoarthritis, uh, the option of doing a uh, hyaluronic acid or gel injection for the osteoarthritis. And the gel, acts as a lubricant for the joint. It, it aids in mobility of the joint and decreases pain by decreasing friction and, and uh, minimizing inflammatory processes that occur within joints when the cartilage is narrow. Um, so these steroid injections can also be performed in the spine, uh, from cervical spine or the neck, uh, mid-back, and lower back. Now, these injections are called epidural steroid injections, and the term epidural means above the nerve roots. Basically, these are intended to reduce nerve inflammation. We do perform these with the anti-inflammatory medicine uh, or cortisone. Um, and, and so the medication is designed, again, to uh, improve function, but it's typically a second-line treatment. This is reserved for individuals who fail physical therapy, they don't do well with pain medication or they can't take it um, uh, due to side effects or uh, other medical conditions. But what happens in the case where you know, the first or second line treatments like injections and physical therapy and you know, prescription drugs don't work? Uh, then we're, what are we stuck with? Well, for osteoarthritis, there is technology available. And uh, Karen alluded to this in my introduction uh, and this is a radio frequency ablation technology. Now, this technology dates uh, back to the early 19th century, uh, sorry, 1900s. And uh, basically, it involves the destruction of sensory nerves. Sensory nerves are nerves in the body which conduct painful stimulus 
from either joints or the skin or uh, muscle or other deep organ tissue to the brain to be processed. So by disrupting the sensory input from, from these joints, and this technology is available for treatment of joints in the spine, knee, and hip currently, um, basically we cut off the, the perception of the pain without really eliminating the actual pathologic process, which is typically a, gen, a degenerative process occurring within that joint space or body region. Um, so this type of uh, procedure requires what we call a test procedure. And the test procedure or nerve block uh, involves placing a special anesthetic, which is usually a long acting anesthetic like bupivacaine into uh, the, the specific sensory nerve uh, that, that innervates or provides sensation to the joint of the, the target joint. Uh, so if we are able to achieve at least 50% or greater, ideally 80% or greater relief from these uh, nerve blocks, then that uh, tells the clinician that the patient would essentially respond to the ablation. Now, ablation means to apply heat to a structure or to burn a structure. And this is also done with needles as well. Um, and so if the patient does respond with that 50% or greater uh, block, then we bring them back in the office and we'd repeat the procedure, but using a specialized needle that we uh, connect to a radio frequency generator. So a radio frequency generator generates a long wave, a radio wave through the, the tip of the needle. And that radio wave will heat the needle tip to about, uh, it varies the diameter, four to eight millimeters of diameter on average. Uh, but that diameter is sufficient enough to burn away the sensory nerve, thereby taking away the sensation from the pathologic joint or um, uh, body region. Uh, typically these procedures would will result in uh, somewhere on the range of 6 to 12 months of relief or, or even greater. And in some cases uh, we've done these procedures on, on patients uh, one time and they've been good for several years uh, before having to come back to repeat these. Now the nerve does grow back and the process of nerve regeneration uh, kind of follows the duration of pain relief. So that six to 12 month range is, is, is that uh, time frame. So who's a candidate? This is usually a patient who has pain greater than three months. Oftentimes, you know, the patient for some reason either does not want surgery, is not a candidate for surgery. Maybe they've had surgery. Uh, they, you know, haven't really rehabbed appropriately. Maybe there's some dysfunction. Uh, in, in the uh, post-operative uh, joints such as arthrofibrosis or some sort of alteration in their gait or walking ability. Um, and oftentimes uh, this is a patient who has significant functional limitations with just basic activities of daily living, getting around without pain and so forth. So How's Mary doing at three months? So Mary did actually elect to uh, go through with the radiofrequency ablation that we offered her after she responded well to her, her blocks, her uh, nerve blocks. Um, she states the low back pain is way more tolerable. She's been taking less medication uh, over the counter. And over the past three months, she's since taken up chair yoga and she's doing some water aerobics. So she was doing so well that we gave her the option to repeat the procedure at six months, but only if the symptoms returned. Ideally, we, we'd be very, very pleased if, if we didn't see Mary back in the clinic because that means that Mary is doing well. So that takes us to our next case, uh, the patient two. Now this is Greg, and Greg's 68, and he comes in and with progressive low back pain, but he also has pain in both legs. And these symptoms are gradually worsening over the past six months or so. So Greg's a retired plumber. He owns his own business. Um, and he can't get out of the kitchen. He can't get out of, you know, the house. He, he loves doing odd jobs around the house. He loves, he loves using his hands and being active. Uh, now, he has no pain sitting, but when he tries to stand up or walk too long, the, patient, uh, the pain stops him in his tracks. He has what he describes as decreased sensation in both of his feet. And when he walks more than two blocks, he has to rest due to this severe burning pain and cramping that, that uh, affects his lower legs. Now, Greg's really concerned because him, he and his, his wife, they like to walk for exercise. And he'd like to continue to do this for as long as he can because he enjoys the health benefits of getting out and, and walking for exercise. 
So this condition uh, is uh, called spinal stenosis, in this case, lumbar spinal stenosis. And so what, I, what I'd like to point out uh, over to the right side is a little bit of anatomy. So uh, this is actually a picture of a, uh, the vertebrae of the cervical spine or neck. So within the cervical spine region, we have the spinal cord in the middle here. And then surrounding the spinal cord, we have ligaments here that uh, connect the bones of the spine from the backside. We also have the nerves as they come out of the spinal cord and exiting from the bones going into the extremity to provide sensation, strength, uh, and function to the targeted uh, location. So the nerve has to pass through this groove here, and this is called the lateral recess. And it exits the lateral recess and it goes into what we call the periphery or the ex external aspect of the spine uh, to provide that um, uh, innervation, that nerve supply. So spinal stenosis can occur in three regions. You can have narrowing in the center around the cord. You can have narrowing at this lateral recess when the nerve attempts to exit initially or uh, narrowing underneath the joints uh, that connect the spine from the lateral aspect or side aspect, and these are called facet joints. Um, so spinal stenosis uh, differentiates itself from uh, osteophritis of the spine in that it, it also usually uh, has a component of some sort of neuropathic pain, usually pain in the legs, cramping in the legs, limitation with standing and walking. This is also a chronic degenerative process such as osteophritis, but the difference is that unlike uh, the degeneration occurring within the cartilage connecting joints, this can also affect the nerves. And uh, degenerative processes that affect nerves can, in late stages, lead to weakness uh, and neurologic conditions or pathology of uh, the neurologic uh, system. So the typical characteristics of patients who have um, uh, spinal stenosis would be the patient who's age 65 or older, um, on average, pain in the lower legs, as I alluded to. Uh, they may present with problems with balance and walking, and this is oftentimes due to problems with sensation. Uh, and they, in late stages, as, as I uh, alluded to earlier, uh, will often develop weakness if uh, this symptom, if this condition progresses uh, um, too far. So usually in the office, uh, if a patient comes in, you, when we're suspecting that they have spinal stenosis, we'll start out with some plain film x-rays. On the x-rays, usually, yeah, we'll pick up in that in that 65 or older population a little bit of arthritis. It kind of comes with the territory. Um, but we'll, we'll also get a really good idea about the uh, alignment of the spine, whether there's uh, bones that are not quite aligned on top of one another that create imbalances within the spine, whether there's curvatures within the spine. Uh, and this will usually uh, kind of uh, clue us into uh, the potential level of pathology. Now, we'll further want to confirm that there is actual nerve compression ongoing uh, by obtaining an MRI of the lower back. And, and this can be done, um, you know, as a follow-up procedure, or it can be done as a, uh, a part of the initial treatment plan. Uh, the MRI is, is essential in, in uh, confirming the diagnosis. And it also uh, allows a practitioner to offer other treatments such as epidural steroid injections. Uh, some of the hallmarks of uh, spinal stenosis would include enlargement of the spinal joints or facet joints, enlargement of that ligament uh, that connects the bones from the posterior side. This is called the ligamentum flavum. And also um, bulging of the intervertebral disc as noted here. And this creates kind of a tourniquet or hourglass formation if you look at the side view, which is what this picture is showing of the lumbar spine or lower back. So, all right, Greg, try PT. He didn't like it. Uh, he didn't do very well in it. Uh, you know, we ended up giving him a little bit of gabapentin. It helped a little with sleep, but the moment he woke up and tried to be active, the pain was there. Um, you know, we tried a couple of epidural steroid injections. Um, he stated that it made the pain worse. And now, you know, the sensation problem is just driving him crazy. So we have to do something. So what are our options? Well, uh, that brings me to um, one class of devices. This is called an interspinous uh, spacer device, okay? Uh, there's a few of these on the market, uh, but this is probably the most commonly used device now, uh, FDA approved in 2016. And uh, 
most physicians uh, were trained on this device by uh, uh, the initial uh, phase was around 2017. So I started offering this device around 2018, and to date we've done about uh, 60 cases or so. And this this condition is called uh, I'm sorry this uh, procedure is called Vertiflex, and the condition it treats is again lumbar spinal stenosis. Uh, so Vertiflex, it's first of all it's FDA approved. It has to be to, to offer to patients. Um, it requires that we uh, make a small incision at the skin here, okay? We deploy a um, device that then uh, unscrews this um, spacer. It looks almost like a jack. And the technique here is this is all external to the nerves, uh, external to the central spinal canal that houses the spinal fluid. So this differentiates itself from the classic, you know, spinal surgical techniques in that it does not cross the uh, blood-brain barrier. It's an outpatient, same-day procedure. It's um, usually done at a surgery center under a, a, um, a monitored anesthesia care sedation, uh, but not a general sedation. It does not require removal of bone or tissue. The, the recovery time is relatively speedy. There is a restriction of about four to six weeks where we don't like patients uh, re bending repetitively, uh, no repetitive you know, motions of lower back. So if, if you like to, to garden and you probably want to wait till the fall to do this uh, type of procedure, um, there is a pretty low risk of infection or complication. Personally, haven't had one, thankfully. And uh, this can actually provide long-term relief to patients uh, from a minimally invasive uh, one-time procedure. So at the time uh, of this talk, there have been more than 10,000 patients who have been treated with um, Vertiflex in the United States. So who's the candidate? Uh, this is usually a patient who has pain with walking that improves with sitting or a shopping cart sign. Uh, they have a poor response to conservative treatments or injections. The, MR, the MRI findings have to confirm spinal stenosis, and the MRI has to be performed within 12 months of, of the uh, procedure. Uh, this patient is usually not an ideal candidate for surgery. Uh, all of my patients will undergo a screening uh, with uh, orthopedic spine surgery uh, to learn the you know, ins and outs of what actual, you know, uh, Poster effusion surgery or minimally invasive decompression surgery may mean for them so they can make the most informed decision possible. And this implant is actually covered by Medicare AB and also most Medicare replacement plans. Um, so individuals who can't get vertiflex are those who have osteoporosis of the spine because we, we don't want the, the spine scaffold to break when we put that, that spacer in there. Uh, and you can't have a history of surgery, uh, decompression, with or without any kind of fusion surgery. And actually the vertiflex does not treat the, the lower part, uh, portion of the spine. So if there's disease at that L5-S1 level, uh, the vertiflex would not be successful in, in uh, treating that uh, pathology. So uh, the company did a five-year study uh, for the FDA prior to approval. And within this study, uh, they had some pretty good outcomes. So 90% of the patients reported uh, a significant satisfaction with the procedure, overall satisfaction on questionnaire. Uh, there was an 85% cohort of patients who reported using less opioid pain medication, which is always a win. 81% uh, of patients uh, reported improved uh, physical function. And 75% of those patients, uh, more, most importantly, had reduction in leg symptoms when they tried to walk reasonable distances. So, as I alluded to earlier, what if the disease is too diffuse? Uh, maybe vertiflex is not the greatest option, or are there any other uh, treatments available for spinal stenosis? Well, that leads me to the, the next treatment, which is uh, called minimally invasive lumbar decompression, or the MILD procedure. Uh, this is also an FDA-approved uh, procedure covered by commercial uh, insurance and Medicare plans. Um, it's excellent for diseases that affect multiple levels in the spine. And there's minimal recovery, act, recovery activity, uh, or, I'm sorry, recovery time or activity restriction, unlike Vertiflex. And individuals who can't have this uh, procedure are those who've had a uh, history of laminectomy with or without fusion surgery similar to Vertiflex. 
Um, so I did actually find a little video for the audience I'd like to play. It's a couple of minutes, but it kind of walks through uh, the procedure and hopefully it gives you an idea of uh, how it works. A mild, minimally invasive lumbar decompression procedure represents one of the greatest advances for interventionalists treating patients with lumbar spinal stenosis, or LSS, neurogenic claudication. This minimally invasive outpatient procedure offers a safe and efficient means of providing LSS patients with significant mobility improvement and pain reduction. The mild procedure requires no general anesthesia, steroids or opioids, and removes a major root cause of stenosis while leaving nothing behind, no implants and no stitches. In LSS, hypertrophy of the ligamentum flavum is common and responsible for up to 85% of central canal narrowing. In fact, a two-year level one study showed that 95% of LSS patients exhibiting central canal stenosis also presented with other contributing comorbidities, and just 5% of patients had central canal stenosis only. Mild focuses on the debulking of the hypertrophic ligamentum flavor, addressing the problem directly. Its safety profile is extremely robust, and has been clinically proven to be equivalent to an epidural steroid injection with no device or procedure-related serious adverse events or complications reported in any clinical trial. The entire procedure can be performed through a single, tiny incision using a narrow, stabilized, depth-limiting portal under still and live image fluoroscopic guidance. The mild bone rodger enables clearance of any obstruction posed by osteophyte growth, providing direct access to the target area. Mild tissue sculptor is uniquely designed to efficiently engage and debulk hypertrophic ligament, allowing for multiple passes before momentary removal and cleaning. Once successful decompression is achieved, the incision can be closed with an adhesive strip. Patients typically resume normal activity within 24 hours with no restrictions. Mild superb, clinically proven safety, efficacy, and durability make mild the next step for LSS treatment after failure of conservative care. Okay, so let's uh, check in on Greg at, at three months later. So Greg actually opted for the mild procedure over Vertiflex. Uh, he was able to achieve 90% relief in his pain within one week of undergoing the procedure. Okay, um, so he's feeling great. He's joined a walking group, and the increased activities resulted in a 15-pound weight loss, uh, which is also in line with his goals of improving quality of life and function. All right, so that takes us to patient three. Uh, now this is Sharon, so Sharon's 69. She's got a 20 year history of back problems, multiple back surgeries. She's, her last spine surgery, was, which was her third surgery, was a four level fusion, and she had that done five years ago. She's also a diabetic who takes insulin to control her blood sugars. Now she has debilitating leg pain, diffuse low back pain. She has no sensation in both feet, and this has caused some significant problems with balance and her walking. The pain is constant burning leg pain and it keeps her up at night. She's tired of taking painkillers around the clock and she wants control back of her life. So this condition is called peripheral neuropathy. And so neuropathy or a, a pathologic state of nerves uh, describes a degenerative condition of the nerves that, uh, that provide sensation and strength to the distal, usually the uh, exterior muscles in the body. Uh, the process starts out with the longest nerves affected first. So nerves in the feet are usually the first to be affected. Uh, the initial symptom usually presents as a symmetric loss of sensation that affect both feet. Now it can progress over time. And uh, usually uh, there is no specific cure for this condition. Um, and there's a number of different uh, causes or etiologies that drive this condition. Um, responses to medications are, are variable, and unfortunately, uh, this tends to be more of a, a, of a progressive condition, although the progression um, may uh, proceed at, at different rates, uh, uh, over 20 years, 30 years, or uh, rapidly, depending on the cause of, of the neuropathy. And as you can see, there, there are plenty of causes. The, the most common cause in the United States is going to likely be uh, uh, insulin-dependent or non-insulin-dependent diabetes. Um, followed by a um, history of alcoholism or alcohol use. 
So we took Sharon through the same treatment. Now, physical therapy was hit or miss for her balance. So she still doesn't feel steady on her feet. Uh, the pain never changed. Uh, she's still taking, you know, six tablets of Norco uh, a day. And, you know, it's life is not fun. So what do we have to offer her at this point? Well, this takes me to our next uh, uh, therapeutic intervention. This is called spinal cord stimulation. So this is decades old ther therapy uh, utilized in a number of different ways. Uh, stimulators have been placed for different nerve functions, uh, uh, vagus nerve function, uh, uh, inter uh, bladder function, and so forth. Um, so there's a pretty broad application of this technology. For the purposes of our patients, it's typically some sort of spine etiology that we treat. It's an implantable outpatient device. It requires a trial period to sort of test drive the technology for a period of five to seven days. Most of these updated devices are going to be compatible with MRI. So even though this is an implant of, 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 a, uh, of a, a metal device, it, it's going to be compatible to get uh, to getting advanced imaging if, if you get the newer generation devices. So individuals who are not good candidates for this would be those who have severe thoracic scoliosis because the leads have to be placed in the mid back or thoracic spine in order to influence the uh, pain um, from the lower back or legs. Um, also individuals who have a history of thoracic spine surgery or other implantable devices such as uh, uh, pacemakers, although uh, we, we would make exceptions in, in some cases, it, it's uh, somewhat of a uh, up in the air in terms of what to do with patients, pacemakers, or uh, who, who, who have other types of stimulators. So this works by blocking pain from the central conducting system, also known as the dorsal column. This is sort of the highway of all of the sensory nerves as they come out of the per peripheral joints, muscles, skin, and so forth, and they join in the center of the, the spinal canal and uh, uh, transduce or, or uh, transmit the n nerve signal to the brain for processing. Uh, the classic therapy would re replace a painful stimulus with a non-painful stimulus. So for example, uh, you'd place the stimulator and during the trial period, patients would experience, say, uh, a buzz or vibration uh, as opposed to a painful stimulus in, in the low back. However, the newer generation uh, technology has uh, evolved to include what we call a paresthesia-free stimulus. And basically, uh, the painful stimulus is completely eliminated and not replaced with a uh, distraction stimulus, such as the vibration. Now, this is an implantable device, and it requires placement of a battery, usually in the flank area. And this battery uh, it can be a non-rechargeable battery with a fixed life or rechargeable battery with, that has a longer lifespan. So the typical candidate for this type of technology would be someone who's had back surgeries, uh, not candidate for further surgery, uh, chronic pain, uh, opioid-dependent uh, patients, uh, individuals have, who have severe peripheral neuropathy that's refractory, uh, refractory to conservative care and treatment, uh, individuals who have complex regional pain syndrome or other nerve injuries, and also conditions such as spinal stenosis, uh, which are also approved, uh, these conditions are also approved for use for SCS technology. So the implant phase requires a successful first step trial phase. And this is hallmarked by 50% or more pain relief for the duration of the trial, that three, five or seven day trial, uh, improve in, improvement in function or sleep and reduced uh, pain medication intake for patients who are on opioids or other pain medications. So three months later, we see Sharon back, and she did undergo the trial, had excellent relief, went to the implant phase. We, we did a paddle implant, uh, had one of our surgeons implant that. And you know, so she's no longer using high doses of the pain medication. She's got uh, much improved sleep, and the stimulator has allowed her to get out of the house more, whereas before she spent most of her days confined indoors. Uh, she's also returned to physical therapy uh, because over time, uh, that, that five-year period following her last surgery, she's uh, noticed a, a functional decline in, in her ability to just uh, negotiate stairs, and she, she just wants to get stronger. 
and she's also joined an exercise class. So, so Sharon is, is doing excellent. So we're going to end the talk on a few slides uh, on regenerative medicine, which I look at as the new frontier in medicine. To this point, uh, much of our uh, medical practice has been designed at uh, management, right? So we manage conditions as they occur. Uh, someone develops high blood pressure, we manage that condition. Uh, but I think the axis is shifting now to prevention, uh, to uh, reversal of, of degenerative processes, and that's where regenerative medicine is going to uh, uh, play a big role moving forward in the future here. So what is regenerative medicine? Well, uh, it's a focus on treatment modalities that prevent or reverse degenerative diseases, and these modalities uh, would include stem cells, um, Amniotic fluid is another uh, sort of stem cell medium that we inject, as well as uh, a um, uh, medication uh, or a solution called platelet-rich plasma, or PRP. Now, the downside of most regenerative medicine products is, is that they're not covered by insurances. It, most of them are in, in the infancy stages, or if you call 30 years of stem cell use, uh, inf you know, infancy, I guess. And uh, the, the hurdle has been the adoption of um, all of the medical data that really suggests that this is, is a viable option for the right patient and right pathology. Um, so platelet-rich plasma is a blood product, okay? It acts as a recruiter of stem cells. It was first used in cardiac surgery, and in practice in the musculoskeletal space, it treats pathology of tendons, ligaments, and joints. It's also used uh, intraoperatively or perioperatively to enhance uh, surgical outcomes in, in regards to wound healing or, or uh, regenerating healthy um, tissue cells uh, in, in the uh, healing process. Now, this is a blood product that's actually extracted from the patient. So <clears throat> blood is drawn in the clinic. It's a five to 10 minute uh, centrifugation process where we spin the blood down. It separates the blood in, in, into three products. One of those products is called PRP. So we'll withdraw the, the platelet-rich plasma, and let's say if a patient comes in with rotator cuff tendonitis, or if they come in with a tear of, of one of the gluteal muscles of the buttocks, we'll uh, use some sort of imaging modality, whether that's fluoroscopy or ultrasound, uh, to actually inject the platelets back at the site of pathology. And that tissue regenerative process takes about three to six months. Uh, stem cells and amniotic fluid are uh, other products. They tend to be a little more costly. Um, there's usually some sort of storage protocol uh, that's a limiting factor in, ter in terms of delivering the product efficiently to patients. Um, it's uh, directly placed at the site of pathology. Um, and you know these cells are basically cells that differentiate into healthy tissue within the organ or joint or uh, system. Um, the next type of technology that I'd like to talk about is called uh, shockwave therapy, and I've been seeing a lot of studies about this recently. Um, it's Shockwave therapy is, is well known for a process called lithotripsy, and lithotripsy is the breaking of uh, renal stones or kidney stones, okay? And it uses a mechanical injury uh, to, in, in the case of kidney stones, bust up the stone. Well, it turns out that those, those mechanical waves also lead to changes on a cellular level, okay? And those changes uh, re uh, result in increased uh, density of uh, blood flow, uh, decreased inflammation, decreased cellular death, and uh, all of these changes promote uh, regeneration of tissue and healing. So it's actually also used currently um, in Europe for uh, post-op recovery and wound healing. Uh, so the typical protocol for something like the shockwave treatment would require about six to 12 treatments just to allow for the cells to, you know, rebound and, uh, and, and sort of regrow and, and recharge between treatments. Uh, the average treatment time is usually going to be about less than 10 minutes, and it is an office-based procedure. And in this case, this is uh, done by a, a handheld device, which is a non-basic procedure. So those are the um, regenerative uh, medicine modalities that, that uh, I wanted to go through. Uh, there may be more, and um, you know, I'm, I'm still looking for the next best um, uh, product to offer my patients.
So I'd like to uh, thank everyone for attending this talk. Hopefully it was very informative and uh, we'll, we'll take some time to address any questions. Thank you, Dr. Clay. Uh, for me in particular, the end was really fascinating uh, with regard to these different regenerative uh, processes that it, it seems like we are basically on the cusp of, is that right? Yeah, so I, you know, I look at many of these products as being in the infancy stages because uh, not, not because the technology is is new, it's because the the abundance of the studies uh, are you know not quite where, where they need to be to offer evidence based uh, recommendations for patients, and that's changing over time. We have some five year studies uh, that are coming to completion that look at the treatment of uh, osteoarthritis with platelet rich plasma, for instance. And you know, as the data becomes more clear, we'll be able to have a better understanding of what really works and what doesn't work. That's that's awesome. You had mentioned that the um, shockwave therapy um, is used over in Europe. Are we not doing it in the United States so much, except for kidney stones? Well, you know, it's interesting in the musculoskeletal arena, it, it, it is not widely used here in the United States yet. However, um, it, it's interesting the professional sports organizations actually use this technology. So the Atlanta Braves, for instance, invested in, in one of these units and used it um, uh, to, uh, they use it on the pitching staff during the, the I think it was the, uh, the American League series last year to get one, uh, a couple of their pitchers up, up, up to a uh, par to go out and compete. So, you know, there, there is some use occurring, but it's mostly in the private sector, uh, not on the patient care, you know, side day to day in the musculoskeletal uh, clinics. So. Gotcha. Oh, that's really fascinating. And, and, um, from, from to your knowledge, did it help those pitchers recover sooner to be able to pitch again? Well, yeah. So, um, you know, the, the condition was you know, tendinopathy of the rotator cuff. And um, so to my understanding, um, after a, a six treatment protocol, uh, they were able to uh, 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 go out and perform um, with, with reduced pain. So uh, it's pretty it's pretty cool. Uh, I've heard that LeBron James has personally endorsed and, and used this technology as well for uh, recovery of uh, various ailments that he, that he suffers. And now all, all of this is, is of course, um, you know, just, you know, reading and, and listening to, to reports from, uh, you know, um, from studies and so forth. But it, it, it's, it's exciting and it's promising. Uh, Technology. There's also laser technology that, that I didn't go into, but you know that's a little bit, uh, you know, that's more seasoned technology. Uh, but there are different generation lasers that we're looking at too for tissue regeneration. So, very cool. And and just another quick question: Do you think that with more evidence-based studies, insurance companies will start to cover these protocols? Well, you know, that's the hope, Karen. I I, I you know, I would hope that once we you know since we've already opened the door to uh um, you know this whole uh outcomes based medical practice right we we have to justify what we do because patients have to get better if we're going to be treating them with these types of devices and surgeries and implants and so forth so i think if the evidence does support this that the, we can pose that argument to the insurers uh to, to the centers for medicaid medicare um, it might take a little bit of lobbying, uh, but I, but I think uh, ultimately this technology will break through, and we and we would be able to get insurance coverage and and uh, yeah, evidence based um, treatment protocols and so forth. Awesome, fascinating. All right, I could talk to you all night about this, but we need to get to other people's questions. So thank you. Um, all right, Mary asks, how do you know? whether to go to see a physiatrist, a rheumatologist, an orthopod, or a pain doctor? I thought that was a pretty interesting question. That's a good question. And, you know, I, I think at least within Illinois Bone and Joint, you can't go wrong with an initial visit to anyone, particularly if you're coming through ortho access, you, you'll see whoever is available on site. We all sort of overlap in, in many ways. Uh, rheumatology overlaps with, you know, orthopedics and pain and that, you know, we, we you know, we, we manage uh, degenerative arthritic conditions. Um, you know, physiatry is, is more of a, you know, uh, a field that's kind of divided between our inpatient physiatrists who treat 
traumatic brain injuries and spinal cord injuries, you know, these traumatic injuries. And then our, our outpatient physicians like myself, they, uh, Dr. Schneider, Dr. Uh, Kerala, and, and, and we're uh, each individually uh, somewhat, somewhat distinct as well. And that uh, Dr. Kerala, you know, has a, an emphasis on sports medicine where I have an emphasis on pain medicine. And, and, and so, um, and then also um, anesthesiology pain, uh, so Dr. Vanderby, Dr. Gates, Dr. Young, you know, we're, we're all very similar. So I, I don't think you'll go wrong uh, by seeing either one of us. Now, I, I think the benefit of being in Illinois Bone and Joint, if you're not in the right place, we'll get you in the right place. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. So you all refer to one another if you think, oh, that person would be better suited to see this doctor, you'll refer him over. Absolutely. Absolutely. Terrific. All right. Great. Okay. Michael asks, what are the side effects of the epidural injections using steroids? So epidural steroid injections uh, do confer a risk of a spinal headache. It, it's um, not very common, but it can occur where, you know, you, you can advance the needle into the dura uh, and create a headache, basically, which is usually self-limited well, over three to seven days on, on average. Uh, there's a risk for infection with any needle procedure, okay? Uh, individuals who take um, who take blood thinners, they, they'd have to be off of the blood thinners for any sort of spinal or epidural procedure. Um, and really, the, the, that kind of entails the risk, at least for lumbar epidural steroids. Now, when we kind of move up the spine, because we do these in the cervical spine as well, obviously, there's the spinal cord, which, you know, uh, is is within the region of the cervical spine. So we have to be a little bit more diligent with, with our approach and, and with our technique. So there is a risk of spinal injury directly in that area. Um, however, if you look at the data, um, epidural steroid injections are the most widely done uh, spinal procedures in the United States. I mean, uh, personally, I, you know, I've done uh, upwards of maybe, uh, I can't count it, it's, it's probably five figures at this point wow. in my career. And, you know, I've been doing these injections for about eight years. So they're very common, in other words, uh, maybe five figures, a little overshoot. But, you know, it, it's a very common procedure. I think the my my biggest issue with epidural steroid injections are um, the chronic conditions don't always respond well to those. So, you know, some of the advanced spinal stenosis, uh, cervical spine, lumbar spine, they don't always do very well with those. And that's why I'm excited about these other technologies that I that I yeah. brought up. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, Michael had asked how long the effects of our, our radiofrequency ablation lasts, and you and you did you did cover that. But the next question would be then, how frequently can someone get them? Can, can you get a bunch in your lifetime or, or are you limited? Yeah, so so this procedure can be repeated every six months. Um, okay. And, it, and it, it is covered uh, through our, our, our you know, Medicare AB, uh, commercial insurers, uh, and approved to be performed every, uh, no, no more frequent than every six months. But, there, but every six months for years and years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is no lifetime limit. Sometimes awesome. what we see is after repeated denervation or sensory destruction of the nerve, uh, as the pain returns when the nerve regenerates, over time, you can have a phenomenon where you have stacking. So the pain comes back, but it's not as bad as it was before. It's still there. You repeat it a little bit less intense as it was prior and, and so forth. So as you continue to perform these ablations, you may find that you see the patients uh, less and less frequent over time. Awesome. Great. Okay. Um, how long is it safe to use gabapentin? For how long? That's a good question. So. Gabapentin is uh, technically, it was designed to treat uh, epilepsy, so seizure disorders. And uh, mm -hmm. seizure disorders can be lifelong disorders. Most of the anti epileptic drugs uh, are intended for indefinite use. Okay. And so the safety profile on gabapentin long term is relatively well. Now, as far as um, the efficacy waning over time, I have noticed that individuals may be on gabapentin for, say, you know, several years and then notice that over time the effects are less and less. Uh, but the, you know, the um, overall toxicity of the medication long term is, is relatively low. Now, uh, most 
centrally acting medications, whether those be opioid pain medications or, or uh, seizure medications or antidepressive drugs, all of these types of medications do confer a small risk of uh, late on, uh, you know, uh, late onset dementia for prolonged use, right? So use over, you know, several years uh, does confer a small risk of uh, increasing the incidence of dementia in your later years. So. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you. All right. Jill asks, can Vertiflex be used for herniated discs? That's also a good question. Typically, if there's a disc herniation and the process is not uh, lumbar spinal stenosis, then Vertiflex would not be a good option for that. And the reason is, is the, the characteristics of pain that, uh, that emerge uh, after disc herniation, uh, they're usually uh, different. And most disc herniations are flexion-based or, you know, the, the, the pain is, is uh, more, I guess, pronounced when uh, the patient is sitting, for instance. And it's very common for herniated disc to be uh, further extruded when you're sitting or driving. And so Vertiflex actually mimics the act of sitting. It, it opens the intervertebral space. So if there's a disc herniation there, you, you probably wouldn't want to put Vertiflex, Vertiflex at that level for risk of uh, extending the disc herniation if it's more of a large acute disc herniation. If it's what we call a disc osteophyte complex or a bulging disc that's more of a chronic condition, um, then Vertiflex would be appropriate. Uh, if the patient met the appropriate um, uh, inclusion criteria. So, you know, pain with walking, standing, alleviated with sitting, positive shopping cart sign, that sort of thing. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, Leslie asks, do you do the, the Vertiflex surgeries and other surgeries, or do you have someone else who does those? So, I, I do the Vertiflex implants and the mild implants and the spinal cord stimulator trials at, at our surgery center at the Morton Grove, uh, Illinois Bone and Joint location. Um, now, for the permanent implantation phase of the spinal cord stimulator, I would typically refer that to uh, one of our orthopedic uh, spine surgeons because I find that typically, um, you know, implanting, it, it, it sometimes depends on the implant. If it's like a, a wider implant or paddle implant, I, um, you know, that will sometimes require a, a small removal of a piece of the bone to implant it in the thoracic spine. So I, I would refer that to orthopedic uh, surgery. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, you know, usually me hands-on uh, doing all of these procedures, um, the vertiflex, the mild, the radiofrequency ablations, which we usually do those in the office. Sometimes we'll do them at the surgery center. It depends on the procedure, um, but yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. That's that's great to know. Um, Suzanne says, she's thank you for addressing peripheral neuropathies and associated pain syndromes. If the peripheral neuropathy pain is the concern and it is not related to an orthopedic condition, is the neurologist or the physiatrist the point person to address the pain? Yeah, so it would, it would actually be neurology or physiatry uh, or pain medication or, or pain management rather. Okay. Uh, anesthesia pain would be appropriate to address pain secondary to peripheral neuropathy because there's, you know, technically it, it is not a, you know, musculoskeletal uh, condition. It is more of a condition with nerves. So. Gotcha. Thank you. And Glenn asks, what have you got for cervical stenosis? Yeah, cervical stenosis. Well, I, the the cervical spine is you know it it's it's a smaller area the spinal cord is is in the region so you, you have to be careful when you uh, are trying to design a device to manipulate the cervical spine so short of you know the classic anterior cervical discectomy fusion surgeries or uh, cervical epidural steroid injections or cervical radiofrequency ablations uh, which can be done in the neck uh, there are currently, uh, not to my knowledge, there, there are no implantable devices that are minimally invasive in the pain medic in the pain management space uh, to treat cervical uh, spinal stenosis. However, I will say that you know, for severe cases of, of cervical spinal stenosis, our, our surgical specialists here at Illinois Bone and Joint do a great job of, of managing that. Great, thank you. All right. Um, do you have a few more minutes for us? I know it's already eight o'clock. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I could take a couple. Couple. A couple more. We we have a lot more, so I'll go with some of the shorter ones. So if you had specific questions, please reach out to Dr. Clay. I'll ask a couple more. Um, is shockwave therapy used to treat idiopathic peripheral neuropathy in the feet? So, you know, the shockwave therapy at this point is is it's mostly used to treat soft tissue injuries. Um, degenerative arthritic, arthritic conditions, it, there, it hasn't really been worked out well in terms of the studies uh, to look to treat um, peripheral neuropathy or nerve injury at this point. Now, uh, that's not to say that in the future there, there will be more uh, studies that, that will I identify this a, as, as an appropriate treatment target, but currently, uh, yeah, it's used mostly for uh, musculoskeletal pain, not nerve pain. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. And I'm just trying to go to see. Um, uh, it looks. I'm trying to. See, I guess I don't want to. I don't want to ask. You know, some of them are so personal, so I'm trying to kind of st stay away from those. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Do, sorry. My apologies. Um, Cheryl asks. Which pain treatment is best for post-operative total knee replacement six months out? You more covered spinal um, and nerve. Maybe, maybe we'll do another talk on that. What do you think? <laughs> well, you know, I did. I did briefly mention the genicular ablation technology. Yeah. So, yeah. At the beginning. Yeah. And so one indication for genicular ablation technology is pain in a post-operative knee. I, my protocol, my personal protocol, and my feeling on this is that we should give uh, the post-operative knee at least at least 12 months, unless the surgeon specifically wants to attempt this intervention within that 12-month post-operative period. Uh, but by one year, you know, if, if patients still have you know stiffness, pain in the, in, the, in the knee, then I'd opt for the the radio frequency ablation uh, protocol for uh, of the the genicular nerve, which is a three nerve complex that surrounds the knee. And it's done uh, via that block that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, we have you go be functional, walk around, be active. If you know your pain gets better, uh, then yeah, we'll, we'll move you on to the uh, ablation stage. So, so that would be my protocol for a, uh, you know, a, a post-operative joint that, that just doesn't, um, doesn't act right after a, after a 12 month period. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much. I, I We do have a few more questions, but I'm going to ask people to reach out to Dr. Clay. Uh, we've got his phone number here, and uh, he, I'm sure you'd be happy to, to see people in your office. There were a couple questions about second opinions. I'm guessing you would see people for those. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight, and Dr. Clay in particular. Fascinating, fabulous presentation. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Take Bye care. Now. Thank you. Bye-bye.